Isso. In the dark of the midnight, have I all in my face while the soul He will do that, amen? Well, good evening. You may be seated. It's good to see you all here this, uh, tonight. It's good to be here uh, with you all this evening. Uh, of course, you all, you all know what uh, happened in our family. This church has faithfully prayed for dad and for mom. And a week ago today, uh, God uh, called dad home to glory uh, early in the morning. And uh, uh, I appreciate the prayers that the church has, has provided for us as we've dealt with that and continue to deal with that. And I just, uh, our, our, I'll say this again on Sunday, but uh, myself and Diana and our whole family just so, um, so blessed and um, um, uh, just so appreciate the outpouring of support the church has showed us and showing up to the funeral and the visitation. That meant so much to us. I wanted to share this from Mom. She, she, she sent a thank you card. She said, Dear Bible Baptist Church, uh, your kindness, love, gifts, and especially prayers have meant so very much to Jimmy and I and our family. And your presence at the visitation and funeral home uh, touched and filled my heart. Uh, much love, uh, Jan Gilbert. And she just she wanted me to share that with you, and she wanted me to express just how, how, how much that meant to her. Uh, and it was a great blessing, great testimony uh, of this church's love and care for, uh, for us and our family. I'll share a little more about that during the prayer request time, but I do ask you to continue to pray for our family. And um, Mom is doing fantastic. Everybody's asking me about that, and, I, and, um, and her faith is strong and her mind is right, and she's, she's really doing well. I mean, she hurts. Her and Dad married for 52 years, and uh, Dad built that house. Dad built that house with his own two hands, it, uh, and, and Mom was right there beside him. It was poetic in a lot of ways. One of the men who works for the, for the, for the funeral home there in their town is a member of the church at Dearborn, 
and he's also an electrician. And I, I, I was in the room where dad's body was, and I was talking to the funeral director, who is new to the community, actually. And I said, uh, you know, you, you're, going, you're getting ready to take him out of here. I said, you're, you're getting ready to take him out of here in the house that, that he built. Because he was, he was talking about the furniture in that room. I said, well, not only did dad, all, all the furniture in mom and dad's room, I said, not only did he build all that furniture, but he built this house. And then I put my arm around Tom, who, uh, if, those of you who were at the funeral home, you, uh, the funeral, you saw him there. He was the gentleman with the beard. And I said, and, and he ran all the wiring. <laughs> he, he was uh, a member of the church and a family, a friend, and he did all the wiring. And, and um, it was just, it, it was something to see them take dad's body from the house, the house that he and mom built and the home that they made. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful to God that he was home and not in the hospital. I'm thankful to God that he passed peacefully and not in a, uh, in a hard struggle. And that made the difficulty of it all uh, a, a little easier. Uh, and so, I, but I appreciate y'all's prayers and, and ask you to continue to pray for mom. Uh, my sister, Lacey, from South Carolina, she's back in South Carolina, and, and I'm back here in Kentucky, and, and uh, uh, Sarah and, uh, is there with mom. And, and I think mom is ready to, to kind of just be alone in her own thoughts for a little bit. Um, I, 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 Diane and I got there Monday. Lacey got there Monday. And then come, uh, come, uh, come Friday night, or come Thursday night, the South Carolina bunch showed up. Come Friday night, the Georgia bunch and the Texas bunch showed up. And come Saturday, Mr. Marine from Japan showed up. Can you give him a round of applause for being here tonight? And uh, we didn't think that was going to happen. Uh, Dad didn't think that was going to happen. And the fact that it did happen was just such a great answer to prayer. And I appreciate Brother Danny uh, Ford. Uh, he helped uh, with that uh, as well. And it, it was just a great blessing. And so it was a great blessing. But come Sunday morning, because no, Ethan arrived really late Saturday, come Sunday morning, there were about 18, 19 of us in the house. And uh, Mom loved it. Uh, but I think she's loving being a little quiet right now, too. Uh, and so uh, keep her in your prayers. And let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll open up our Bibles to the book of Revelation after we pray, and then after we have a little time in God's Word, we're going, we're going to conclude this study tonight, uh, going through the, the New Testament in big chunks, uh, and we'll, we'll start a new study in a couple of weeks. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. After we pray, if you haven't grabbed one, uh, you'll want to get one uh, tonight uh, especially. But let's, let's pray together right now before we open up God's Word together. Bobby Boring, would you lead us in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come to your house and worship you. I thank you for what you mean to me and what this church means to me. I thank you for Pastor Travis and preparing the word that we need to hear tonight. I pray for his family. I pray to continue to be with his mother as she's going through this different, different times. I know she... She depends on you and is faithful, but it can still be different. Lord, I pray that we will listen to the message and apply it to our hearts. And I thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. We've come to it. Um, and I want to read, uh, to begin, I want us to read the first three verses to introduce it. And then uh, I'll read what I think are the, the two verses that are kind of the key verses, the, the key passages uh, for the book. If you remember, as we've gone through this study, and I think it's a good practice for everybody to do, and you might, you might come to a little different uh, outline or key passage than I have, but uh, I've provided for you with each one of these studies an outline of the book and what I think is a key passage or two for uh, the book, and uh, I'll read those. But let's, let's start off Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. Now notice this. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this, what's that next word? Prophecy. 
and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So that's the introduction to this book. I highlight that part because we can often think that this is a, a book that sometimes we can pay too much attention to it. Sometimes we don't pay any attention to it at all. But God's Word says, blessed is the one who reads and hears the Word, and he identifies it. God's Word identifies the book as a prophecy. Now, here's what I think are the two key passages. The first one is verse 19. So look at chapter 1, verse 19 with me. Write the things, this is, this is the glorified Jesus speaking to John, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things that which shall be hereafter. That kind of provides an outline uh, for the book as well. Now look at chapter 17, verse 14. This is what I would call the second kind of key passage. Let, let's us know what the whole purpose of this book is and, and where, it's, where it's going. Chapter 17 and verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So those are, that's the introduction and, and what I would consider the, the key passages uh, of, the, uh, of the book. Key passages let us know what the book is all about and, and where it's headed and, and kind of summarize the book in, in just a, a verse or two. And I don't think there's any book of the Bible that captivates people's attention, that stirs the imagination or creates more questions, uh, incites more debates than the book of Revelation. I know when uh, I was in the army when this happened, but uh, Pastor Sparks, when he preached through the book of Revelation at uh, Dearborn Baptist Church, this was back in the day when they were recorded on, the sermons were recorded on audio tapes, but uh, that, that tape series, he has told me since then, that tape series was the most requested series of any uh, book that he'd preached through ever, uh, up to that point and even after that point, because people were just uh, so curious about the book of Revelation. Brother, Brother Thomas out in Texas, when he preached through Revelation, and he did it on a Sunday night, su Sunday nights, um, you know, one of the most well-attended Sunday night series uh, in my tenure there with him, because it, it just grabs people's imagination, and there's all kind of uh, they have all kind of questions, and, and unfortunately, sometimes we have all kind of debates and arguments about what the book of Revelation uh, reveals. And it's the capstone of divine revelation. This is, this is the one book uh, that's uh, prophetic in, in the New Testament. There are other prophecies in the New Testament, other prophetic utterances, but this is the one book, especially chapters 4 through 22, which are future, future prophecy. At least that's the way I understand it, and I'll explain that as we go along. In this book, the curtain is pulled back, and the future is revealed for, for everyone to see. And the first five words of the book let us know what the title is. If you look at chapter 1, verse 1 again, this is the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated uh, revelation is uh, the Greek word is apocalypsis, or apocalypsis, and we get the English word apocalypse from, uh, from that Greek word. Uh, most of us, if we hear the word apocalypse, probably revelation, unless you're from church world and have heard this preached before, but most people, when they hear apocalypse, they don't think of revela revelation or something being unveiled. When most people hear apocalypse, what they think is the end of the world, something catastrophic something about to go down that is really severe. And I, you can understand why people might think that even if they understood what the word means after reading this book, because there are a lot of crazy, wild, and unnerving things that are described in the book of Revelation. But the word means unveiling, not doom, not destruction. And it is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Um, um, Christ, uh, Christ is, he, he, he arrives there in, in, in the Gospels, and, and the Gospel is preached in the Gospels, and Jesus is explained as much as can be possible, possible uh, uh, in, in, in the epistles. He's preached in the book of Acts, uh, but he's expected, and he returns in the book of Revelation, and it's the unveiling of Christ 
in that book. Now, if you look again at verse 1, the end of verse 1, this, uh, this, uh, his servant, Jesus' servant John, is the one named. And the traditional view, and I believe the correct view, is that that John who is named is the apostle John, who was inspired to write the book of Revelation, as well as the gospel of John and the three general epistles which bear his name. And by the, when you read through the gospels and you hear the story of the apostles with Jesus, John is probably the youngest of those 12. He's probably the youngest, but by the time you get to the Revelation, and really uh, uh, the, the, the three letters, if you remember, he refers to himself as the elder, which doesn't just identify his position. Uh, keep in mind that elder is used two ways in the New Testament. Elder is another word for pastor. There are, there are several words that are used for pastor in the New Testament, elder, bishop, uh, shepherd, ruler, overseer, and they are translated from different words that mean uh, uh, episkopos and um, uh, po uh, poimenon, and I, I forget the third one off the top of my head. Um, but those, those, were, those, those different uh, words that are translated in English, bishop, overseer, ruler, uh, shepherd, uh, their el elder, they all identify a pastor. And then also the word is used as an older person, a person who is older in age. And by the time these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the Revelation are written, John the Apostle qualifies on both levels. He's older and he's, uh, of course, a pastor, uh, as uh, a pastor of the church at Ephesus and, and uh, a leader in the church, churches as an apostle. And so the traditional view is that this is the John who wrote, who was inspired to write the book of Revelation. And he was exiled on Patmos during the reign of the Roman emperor uh, Domitian. And under that emperor's uh, reign, he severely persecuted uh, the Christians. He, and he did so because he aggressively promoted emperor worship. So for instance, and this is in your notes, he demanded uh, when he was referred to and when they had their, uh, their annual um, e events where people in the Roman Empire would express their allegiance to Rome, he demanded that he would be addressed as our Lord and God Domitian. It's a pretty high view of yourself, right? Our Lord and God Domitian. And of course, if you're going to be a Christian in that kind of uh, environment, in that kind of government, and if you're going to be a Christian with a clear conscience, and if you're going to be a, a, a Christian who is going to try to honor God, you can't call anyone else Lord and God. Amen? You can't do that. And uh, I don't want to get sidetracked. There's all kinds of things that could be said. Well, it, he's not really my Lord and God. I'll just say it, and I'll go back home to my family. It's more important that I'm home with my family. I don't mean it. God knows that I don't mean it. God knows that he's my only Lord and God. Uh, but it does matter what we say. It does matter how we project ourselves to the public. Um, um, it, th those th it does matter what we go on record as supporting. And Christians would not, um, by and large, uh, follow in that, um, that uh, requirement, and, and they were severely persecuted as a result. And uh, tradition says that they tried to, uh, they tried to execute John, I think, uh, by boiling him in water, but he survived, and then they, they exiled him to Patmos. And so um, it, it's, it suggested that this was uh, written around because of that, because of, uh, um, of um, uh, Domitian's reign, this book is dated as A.D. 95 to 96, while John is exiled about 40 miles off the coast of Ephesus on Patmos. And, and while there, he received these visions from the Lord. And if you look at verse 4, uh, he received them um, um, uh, on the Lord's day. John, uh, John to the seven churches, verse 4 says, Which are in Asia, grace be, grace be unto you in peace from, from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and, to, uh, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests 
unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, a, uh, a, amen. And then uh, um, verse 9 is where I was heading for. Uh, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that was called Patmos for the word of, of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And then that's when the vision that he received uh, started. So even though he was exiled and very likely by himself, you know, he wasn't by himself because he wanted to be. He wasn't by himself just because he thought he needed a little, uh, a little uh, uh, retreat, uh, a little private personal retreat. He was, on the, he was by himself uh, on the Lord's Day because he was exiled, but he was still worshiping. And that's, that's the desire that we all should have, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what we can do or cannot do or are allowed to do, uh, to worship God at all times, but especially uh, in a unique way uh, on the Lord's Day. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into this in any kind of depth, but the dating of this as this book of A.D. 95 to 96, um, we, we, I, I, that's what a, a traditional uh, conservative Bible scholar is going to date the book as. I think there's great evidence for that, both internally from what we read in the book and also uh, uh, external historical evidence. But if uh, there, there are some scholars, um, and not just liberal scholars, but others, who either, if it's a liberal scholar, they want to date it much later, which they always do, to try to undermine the authority of Scripture as if this all was written much later than the original events that are described because they try to cut away the authority and inspiration of Scripture. But there are some very conservative Bible scholars who date the writing of the book much earlier, and that's because it fits their view of uh, how to interpret the book of Revelation. And we'll, we'll talk about that more when we get into it. But if you want to do a deep dive into that, uh, I encourage you to do, uh, to, do, to do just that. And there are resources that you can find um, either online or, or in bookstores or, or libraries, or you can even ask me, and, and, and I'd let you borrow some of the stuff that I have. And you could do a deep dive on, on those kind of things if, if you think that would be fruitful. Um, but I, I think it's a good, uh, I think it's a good and, and accurate and safe estimation to think that this, uh, understand this as being uh, written, revealed to John and written late in the first century. So the background and theme of the book, the original recipients, uh, as you see here, if you look with me again, in chapter one, the original recipients of this letter were the seven churches in Asia, uh, which is uh, Ephesus. Uh, uh, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And uh, those, those uh, churches are, are churches in Asia. I forgot my PowerPoint tonight, uh, and I, I would have had a map up uh, of those things, but you can look there in the back of your, in the back of your Bibles and look on your, uh, look on your maps, and, and you can see in uh, the Roman province of Asia. And you got to remember, when the Bible's talking about Asia, it's not talking about China and Japan and uh, the Philippines, all right? That's, that's, that's what we understand as Asia. The Bible, the New Testament, when it refers to Asia, is talking about the Roman province of Asia, which is what we would call Western Turkey, sometimes referred to as Asia Minor as a result of all that. But that's where, that's where these churches were. And the, uh, these seven churches, they were real churches that existed in the Roman province, province of Asia. And uh, the, the introduction of the book in the first two chapters, chapters two and three, I should say, are seven individual letters with inside the overall letter of Revelation. And the only one of these churches that was personally planted by Paul was the church at Ephesus, and we've, we've talked about that when we've gone through the book of Acts. But Acts chapter 19, verse 26, reminds us that when, uh, when that church at Ephesus, which was, which was just going gain busters uh, in the very beginning especially, and, and just turning the world upside down, well, that's exactly what were, people were saying about it. And one of, the, one of the critics of Christianity in Acts chapter 19, 
verse 26, talking about Demetrius the silversmith, he said, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that there be no gods that are made by hands, that the only, there's only one God, and he's God uh, in, in heaven, and there are no gods that are made by hands. And so it's very safe to say, and I'm repeating what I've told you before and what you've heard from others before me, that the church in Ephesus was planted by Paul and most likely those other six churches, and not just those six churches, but others beyond that, were planted as a result of the ministry of that church in Ephesus. It was a very influential and, and maybe even the largest of the churches. And by influential, I mean that it was used to plant these other churches. Now, we know that Ephesus is the only one of those seven churches. So those seven churches, just to remind you, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Uh, Ephesus is the only one that Paul uh, uh, was, personally, was personally involved in planning. But that doesn't mean that Paul or the other apostles were unaware or disconnected from these other churches. You know, Paul, Paul, wrote, uh, uh, Paul wrote to the uh, in, uh, to the Colossians, that, that, that church isn't mentioned, but in the Colossian letter, and I think even in the, uh, in, in the Colossian letter for sure, he mentions the church at Laodicea. Colossae was a town that was nearby Laodicea. Um, and, and he said in Colossians 4.16 that make this letter be read in, La, in, the, in the church at Laodicea. And the letter that I wrote to them, the letter that I wrote to the Laodiceans, you read as well. Now, that letter evidently was not inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we, we don't have a record of it um, anyway, uh, but, but Paul was aware of those churches. And in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, these seven letters to these seven churches in the Roman province of Asia, uh, they each received a, a unique uh, and very specific letter from the glorified Christ. That area had been settled by Greeks ever since the day of Alexander the Great. If you remember Alexander the Great, he uh, crossed uh, the Helen spot uh, there in, in what is now you know, Istanbul, and he came down into um, and he came down through that part of what we call Turkey, and and that was part of his invasion of the uh, Persian Empire. And uh, really, maybe even before that day, but especially from that time, Greeks had settled into that part of what we call Turkey. And many Jews had settled into that area as well. Some of the Jews might even have predated the Greeks because uh, there were many Jews in the Persian Empire who would have been dispersed throughout the Persian Empire, and they may have been there already when the Greeks began to settle in those areas. But these early churches were successful in evangelizing both Greeks and Jews. You could read about that as well in Acts chapter 19. But by the time, here's what I want you to get, by the time the book of Revelation was written, all of these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, all of these churches were second generation congregations. That means that their parents, uh, or, the, or at least those old enough to be their parents, had been the ones led to Christ, the ones uh, uh, through whom the church was established uh, and, uh, and who ministered. And now this was a church, this was a generation that by and large, not exclusively, but by and large would have grown up in, in church. They stood on the shoulders of those who had gone before them. And they were facing trials just like the, the previous generation had and just like every congregation has to handle. They were facing trials that are, that are universal to every generation, to every culture, to every area, but they were also facing trials that were unique to their era and to their culture. Uh, and, but one, one persecution, one trial that is a constant is the pressure to conform to your surrounding society. It doesn't matter if you're Greeks in Turkey or, it does, or if you're a, a, a Jew or if it's um, further east or further west or north or south or here in Rockcastle County in the 21st century. One of the pressures that every church faces is the pressure to conform to those around them. And if you don't, 
to face persecution. Whatever that persecution may be, it looks different. We are so blessed in our lifetimes and for many lifetimes before us in this nation that the persecution that we may face for not conforming to those around us is very slight, right? Really slight compared to, well, compared to Americans in the early days of our nation, even before we were a nation, when we were colonies, and especially, and especially compared to Christians in other communities and other nations and other cultures well before us, and still in nations and cultures other than ours today. Let's not think that persecution has ended, amen? It's alive and well. I mean intense persecution where it's costing Christians their lives. It still happens and, and may, uh, may even have increased more than uh, in, in biblical times. And, and these seven churches, some of them anyway, were facing this pressure to conform, were, pressing, were, were facing these trials and temptations that come against every church, against, uh, to every generation. Every generation has to face this. Amen? The question is, how is every succeeding generation going to handle it? Some churches, during certain parts of their life, handle that kind of pressure and persecution much better than either previous generations or newer generations did. Some, some churches uh, mishandle such persecution and such trials and such pressure to the point that they cease to exist. As a matter of fact, the church at Ephesus was warned about that very thing. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I might talk about that in a little bit. But I, I'm convinced that one thing we are going to do, and, and heaven help me and you pray for me, I'm thinking we're going to go into, we're going to trip into a, um, a study of Revelation. Um, I, 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 I've, I've at least been working on the first three chapters. The first three chapters uh, I, I really love to, to dive into and study. It's chapters 4 through 22, which make me a little weak in the knees. But I think we're going to. I think we're going to go into it, and, and and I'll just take my time, and I'll take breaks from it when I need to. Uh, I, I think that'd be good for me and you. Uh, but I, I think we're going to start that pretty soon. Uh, I was I was going that direction before uh, before things turned sideways with Dad, but and, and I think we'll uh, I, I think we'll continue going in that direction. But here's the church at Ephesus. I just told you that it was it was the center point of Paul's ministry in. Asia. I mean, Paul spent three years in that church. He, he, he didn't stay that long anywhere. It's, it, it was a, yeah, he was an apostle. It's different from, from any other church, churchman. Uh, we, it's not good for us to compare ourselves to Paul. Well, Paul was only there for, I mean, Paul planted the church in Thessalonica, and as far as we can tell, he was only there for three weeks. I don't recommend missionaries do that. You understand? But when you're the Apostle Paul and it's the transition po a period between uh, the ascension of Christ and the completion of the New Testament canon, there are some things that are a little different than they are for the rest of us. But Paul stayed for three years total at Ephesus. And this was a, uh, this church, uh, Timothy pastored that church. John, most, we know Timothy for sure pastored that church. We think John pastored that church and others. And yet, by the time this, this letter is received from Ephesus, from the glorified Christ late in the first century, Jesus is saying to them, you, you, need, to, you need to remember from where you've fallen. You need to uh, return to your first love. Repent and do the first works. Return to your first love. Or your candle is going to be taken. And I'm convinced that's a reference to that church being snuffed out. No longer existing. And there's a difference between a church having a facility and having its doors open and having service hours and it being a church in which Jesus Christ is. Amen? We'll get into that, not later tonight, but when we get into that series. I don't want to scare you too much. I keep saying we'll get into that later. You all are going to think you'll never get out of here. But I'm talking about later in that study. But these these second-generation churches were facing some of these issues without the stable, seasoned leadership of the previous generation. And it showed. It showed in what Christ had to say. 
Now, the primary purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal the future. Everything in the book points to Christ's ultimate return, the risen, glorified Savior who appeared to John on Patmos is the same person who returns with his triumphant church at the end of the book to reign from Jerusalem in his millennial kingdom. The revelation ends with an invitation. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 22, verses 17 through 21. And I'll read those five verses. The book ends with an invitation. Revelation 22. And keep in mind, it's the revelation, not the revelations. Not that that matters too much, but just it's, it, it's worth being saying it once or twice. But Revelation 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, aren't you thankful for that? And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy. There's that self-identification of this book being a prophecy again. For I testify that every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So this book ends with an invitation for whosoever will to come while there's time to come to trust in this, trust in this Christ, to drink of the water of life that he freely offers to all. Because if you wait until he comes, then you've waited too long. When he comes at this end to put an end to his adversaries. And so right now is the right time to respond to this Lord's call. Let's briefly catalog some unique characteristics of Revelation. First of all, it is a prophetic book. I've, I've talked about that from chapter 1 and here uh, at the very end. So um, I've put some passages in there. And keep in mind, that's not necessarily an exhaustive list. Whenever you see certain passages that I've put in your notes, it's not always an exhaustive list, just, just pointing out what I'm talking about. But it's a prophetic book. It's a Christ-centered book. It, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why is it important, you think? And, and uh, you can answer me if you want, but just, I just want you to think and want you at home to think. Why is it important to emphasize that this book is centered on Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ? One of the reasons why it's so important is because when it comes to this book especially, we get so caught up in charts and timetables, and uh, this and that, and, and that we're, th we're thinking about horsemen, and we're thinking about bowls, and we're thinking about trumpets, and we're thinking about all these other things, and guess who we've forgotten? Jesus Christ. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And I could honestly say that about all of Scripture, especially the New Testament, but not only the New Testament, but very specifically this book, this, this book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is an open book. It's not closed. One of the things I appreciate about people uh, who are really consumed with the book of Revelation, one of the things I really appreciate about them is that they recognize that this is not a book that we're supposed to stay away from. That there have been some people down through uh, church history who have, who have not even encouraged people to read Revelation. That it's something that, that, that should be uh, avoided. I don't understand that. I, I, I understand it's hard to understand, and I recognize that uh, there's, there's so much symbolic language in it that it can make it very difficult. But I also recognize that it says at the very beginning, you read it with me, blessed are those who read this book and understand it. 
So it's an open book. It's not a closed book. And it is the symbolism. That's another unique characteristic of Revelation. The book contains a lot of symbolism. But I want you to recognize this. Just because there is symbolic language used doesn't mean that we should view it as an allegory or just a metaphor. We should understand that this should be literally interpreted. So there is symbolic language, but it should be literally interpreted. The book is saturated with the Old Testament. There are 278 references in the 22 chapters of Revelation, 278 references, uh, either direct quotes or allusions or, or those kind of things, allusions, not illusions, but uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the Old Testament. Um, numbers. I, I, I'm not big on numberology. Um, I... I, I this is, one, this is one of the reasons why I, I always hesitate to preach from Revelations 4 through 22 because I, 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 I hate to, I don't mind stepping on toes, but I don't, I don't like stepping on toes that, don't, that, don't, that aren't important. <laughs> you know, when it comes to numbers and, and all these other kind of things. And, and, and even me saying that they're unimportant can make some people start to, start to twitch in the pew. Um, I, you, they have a place, but you can't avoid this when it comes to Revelation that, that numbers are a unique characteristic of the book. And so, and so there's, there's seven churches, there's seven seals, there's seven trumpets, there's seven vials or bowls, there's seven lampstands. Three and a half is a number that's repeated. And you could look this up in those verses. I'm not going to take you to all them. That's why I'll give you a handout. But three and a half is repeated, um, as is the number 12. The number 12 is repeated, and so are the multiples of 12, like 24 or 144,000. And so... Uh, I, I don't know that we always need to make a big issue of numbers either in Revelation or the rest of the Bible, but I also don't think we should ignore it and act like it doesn't exist because especially in this particular book, numbers are a unique characteristic of it. And then obviously it's a climactic book. It shows the fulfillment. This is the culmination of God's plan and purpose, which starts back not just in Genesis, but uh, Ephesians tells us before the beginning, uh, before the the dawning of time before uh, any, any eternity passed. Now, I'll say this, and this is in your notes because I want, it, I want you to be able to reference it. We should interpret Scripture in its plain, literal sense and seek no other sense, lest it all result in nonsense. We should interpret Scripture in its plain, literal sense and seek no other sense, lest it all result in nonsense. Jesus refers, let me give you a really easy example of that. Jesus refers to himself as the water of life, as the bread of life, as the door of life. He is not H2O. He is not homemade bread. He is, or any kind of bread. He is not uh, a literal door. That is symbolic, allegorical language that is used to preach a literal truth. There is no life apart from drinking or eating or walking through, uh, drinking the water, eating the bread, walking through the door, that is Jesus Christ. That is literal truth that is revealed and expressed in symbolic language. Right? That makes sense. And that the same, the same mindset needs to be applied to Revelation. It's harder in Revelation because there's a lot of things that are happening there uh, that uh, can really uh, take us in, in directions that, um, that aren't always um, where, where we can get carried away where we shouldn't be carried. Um, and there's also some, some, uh, some graphic scenes that are happening in Revelation that, that will transpire just the way they're described, and, and it takes a lot for us to sift through that, but we can. And, and, and we will. So, Scripture uses figurative language, and the revelation is loaded with it. But that doesn't mean that we should approach revelation as if it's an allegory. Let me give you an example of an allegory. When I was, when I was in New Orleans for that DEFEND conference, one of the speakers was a, was a C.S. Lewis specialist. Uh, what's the most famous book that C.S. Lewis wrote that you can think of anyway? Chronicles of Narnia, absolutely. Uh, maybe there's others that you like better, but Chronicles of Narnia is what he's most famous for. And probably the most famous of those seven books is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
It was the first movie that was made from those books. And that book especially is an allegory of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. So the Aslan character, the lion, the creator of Narnia, dies on a stone tablet in place of Edmund, who uh, had uh, uh, who had sinned, uh, had had broken uh, this this deep magic, and the only way for Edmund to be spared, because his life was now forfeit, the only way for him to be spared was for Aslan to offer himself for Edmund, and then after he was he, and he died, he was killed. Edmund was spared, and but then he, but then three days later, you know Aslan was back. And that's an allegory. So that's, um, let me give you a more classic allegory. Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory of uh, the, the, the sinfulness of man, the salvation that's experienced through Christ alone, and then the Christian's walk um, through this life all the way to the celestial city. It's a great allegory. Uh, I, I, would encourage, uh, I would encourage you to read both those books if you haven't read, um, if you haven't read them. If you have read them, read them again. Those are allegories. Revelation is not. Now, there are good brothers and sisters in Christ who think it is. We'll talk about that here in a second. You'll, you'll see that in your handout, especially the, the, the middle handout that you have. It's also not mythology. Mythology is fables and stories that, uh, that aren't real, but they express real lessons uh, uh, that, that, that we should understand. And that's, uh, that, that kind of approach that spiritualizes the book misses the point. So while good people, while good people differ on their understanding of the Bible, especially the details of Revelation, we need to know why we believe what we believe and hold to the, this is important, hold to those positions with a spirit of grace. Now, um, let me just uh, look, look at the first part of the, uh, of the outline with me real quick. Uh, I'll just kind of tease that series that will start here soon. But you see uh, those seven churches of Asia. So, so re remember verse 19 of chapter 1, which I said could be used as a broad outline for the book, and that's exactly what you see. The things which you have seen, which is chapter 1, when he sees the glorified Christ, and then the things which are, he's writing to those seven churches in Asia in chapters 2 and chapters 3, that's, that's in, in the moment, and then the things which are to come. He's caught up into the clouds to a vision, and that's, and that's what he sees in chapter, uh, chapters 4 through 22 that he writes. And that's the breakdown of it. And uh, the, the things which are, this is where we'll start when we get into the series, obviously. But you have, you have preoccupied Ephesus. Th these are warnings to us. It's powerful because we need to be reminded it's so easy for us to be caught up in, in, in a lot of these attitudes that we see expressed here. This was a privileged church. It was a privileged church in, uh, in its role in, the re in redemptive history, privileged in who had pastored it in the past, privileged in how God had used it, but that privileged church had lost sight of their first priority, and they'd become preoccupied with other things, some of which were good things, but they'd become preoccupied to the point that Jesus said, you're in danger of no longer existing as a church. And then the persecuted church, persecuted Smyrna, um, there's, no, there's, no, there's no condemnation, there's no correction for this church. This, this church was suffering, but it was standing firm. Then you got the, pol uh, the political church. And by this, I mean they were caught up in political correctness, they, uh, uh, which, which is synonymous with compromise. You know, political correctness does not mean treating people politely. Political correctness does not mean uh, treating people with dignity and respect as human beings. Political correctness means compromising where you shouldn't compromise. And that was the church at Pergamos. But the polluted church is the longest letter of all the seven. And this was a church that, fought, that tolerated false teachers. And obviously, if you're going to tolerate false teachers, you're going to have false teaching. 
Uh, the powerless church. This was a church that had a name. This is what Jesus said about them. You have a name that you're alive. So they had, they had a website. Uh, they, had, uh, they had a presence in the community. Uh, there, there were services posted and services held. And Jesus said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. That's powerless. It might have influence to a certain degree, but it's powerless. The persevering church, is, this is another church that wasn't condemned or corrected. It was only commended, and they were commended for pressing on, they were, um, and they were promised to be kept. One of the reasons why I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, not only because of the letter to the church at Philadelphia, but partly because of what's said to that church. And then just so I could stick with the peas, I called Laodicea the puke-inducing church. Uh, but it's not just to stick with the peas. I mean, Jesus said, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Vance Havner said, you can't dress that up. This, this church was not commended at all. Even the church at Thyatira got commended. I mean, they had false teachers and were teaching falsehood in the church. But even they were commended. But the church at Laodicea was not commended at all. They were only condemned. But they obviously had material prosperity. But Jesus says you're blind, naked, and destitute. And, and, and they were also in danger of losing their candlestick, not becoming, losing their status as a church. And so uh, we'll get into those, Lord willing, here really soon. And then um, if I have the courage, we'll continue on in chapter 4 and beyond. Look at this handout, the, the, the middle handout, uh, with me really quick. I'm not going to read every word on this. You, you could do that. But I, there, there's no way, and it wouldn't have been profitable for me, and it would have taken too much time, but not enough time to have a second sermon. Uh, but, but, and it would be better for you to have this anyway. Um, but there are, there are four major, there are four main approaches to the Revelation. And you see that they're preterist, historicist, idealist, and, 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 and futurist. The preterist, a, a lot of times the, the, the people who hold to this view are people who are very uh, conservative and traditional Bible scholars. You'll find a lot of people in Presbyterian camps who hold to this view. A lot of people who have a covenant theological position will hold to the preterist view of Revelation. And that's why they date. Remember, remember, I, um, uh, I presented to you what I believe that this book was written around uh, the end of the first century, 95, 96, around that area A.D. Well, a preterist is going to hold to a much earlier position because a preterist holds to the point that this was all fulfilled in A.D. 70 when um, Titus, the general of Rome, uh, on orders of his father, the emperor Vespasian, destroyed the temple, um, and they view that uh, all the chaos and destruction that's, that's um, connected there in Revelation to, to, that, to that point in history. So they, they, view, they view Revelation as a historical record, not as a prophetic record. The big problem with that is what does Revelation call itself? A prophecy. So, is there historical truth? Oh, well, ab absolutely, especially for us, because uh, those seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3, you know, it's, that's all history for us. So there is a historical component, but it is a book of prophecy, and it, and it says it is. Uh, the historicist, uh, uh, they also ignore the, the claims of Revelation it's to be a, pr a prophetic book. Uh, um, it, 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 it kind of allegorizes uh, all that's going on there. It's, uh, when you do that, you, you just kind of pick and choose what you want these different events in Revelation to mean. It's not, not a very safe place, not a very safe way to interpret Scripture. The idealist uh, views it as, as strictly symbolic. Uh, it's kind of like Aesop's fables or Mother's Goose. You just, these, are, these are powerful stories that you can learn and you kind of draw your own conclusions. They're, they're just stories from which we're, we're taught lessons. The futurist approaches chapters 2 and 3 as real history, and the rest of the book is prophetic, recognizing that while symbolic language is used, just as it is everywhere else in Scripture, 
we should interpret the book of Revelation literally, grammatically, historically, um, just like we do uh, other uh, all the rest of Scripture. Now, if you flip it over, you'll see the three different views on the millennium. Now, the millennium, mean, millennium means thousand years, and we're talking about the thousand-year kingdom. And if you look at the bottom of that table, the pre-millennial position, which is what our church is, not because of me, it, 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 as far as I know, it always has been, but, but when you have a church that goes back 100 years, I, I can't speak to, to, to it all the way back, but I know, I know Brother Don for sure would have been a premillennialist, and everyone who holds to a futurist interpretation of Revelation falls into the premillennial camp, including people who are pre, mid, and post-trib on the rapture view. Now, and, and, and there, I, I know there's been people who have preached here before who have had different positions than that than your pastor does now because one of, one of those people was my good friend who was Brother Don's really good friend. And uh, when you asked him, Brother Richard, lot speech, uh, how you doing today? I'm doing well. And have I told you about the post-tribulational position? <laughs> he, he just couldn't wait to get there. You know, how you feeling? I'm feeling great. And by the way, for, uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 says, and, and that's just what uh, he was just, he, he loved to talk about. Uh, but regardless of what your uh, tribulational, what, regardless of your rapture position, you're still in the premillennial uh, millennialist camp and, and the futurist camp. Um, you, you, I, I know Baptists who we, who, who we fellowship with who hold to an amillennialist position. They don't believe in the millennial kingdom. So, in other words, uh, um, um, they, they, uh, they don't believe in a, um, they, they believe that the millennial kingdom is a literal kingdom in heaven or Christ is saints rule but, and that Jesus is coming again, but they reject the notion of a future physical kingdom on the earth. I don't understand that position. That they, they never have given me a good defense of that position, uh, but there are some who hold to that. Um, there were some Baptists down through history who had a post-millennial position, and some that I respect really well. Like, I believe, don't quote me on this, you have to do your own research, but I think Spurgeon would have had a post-millennial position. And they think that Christian influence in society will, will, will bring in the kingdom. You know, you know, during Spurgeon's lifetime, at the end of the 19th century, it's kind of easy to understand why some of them would have held to that position, especially in places like England, where um, society was really trending in a very moral, Christian-influenced um, pattern. And of course, that, that example was already going on in the States, and then the British Empire had seen a revival and, and, was, and was trending that way. And the British Empire not only had influence in the British Isles, but it was the British Empire on which the sun never set. But then, and Spurgeon died at the end of the 19th century, but then a little thing happened called World War I, and then World War II, and then uh, communist regimes, and the 20th century was the bloodiest century in human history, and you don't really find too many people today who think things are getting better and Christians are reigning in the kingdom, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's not an accurate position anyway. I'm not trying to make fun. Uh, I just don't think that that makes any sense. But those, those are the three major views of the millennium. Those are the four main uh, views on Revelation. And that is our jet tour through Revelation. And so, Father in heaven, we thank you for time to be spent in your word. We thank you, Father, for um, this book of Revelation. We know how it ends, and I pray that we will be students of it. Uh, and uh, I ask, as, uh, we, uh, as I anticipate us going into a study uh, of the book of Revelation, Lord, I ask you to bless us um, and bless me as I seek to... Um, rightly and truly give the sense. And may we all have grace for one another because in, indeed, Father, when it comes to those chapters 4 through 22, I, I think your scripture is clear. Your, your word is, uh, um, is, is rightly revealed to us. Uh, we are the ones who have problems at times with, in the understanding of it and give us grace, especially when it comes to these things which are yet to come. 
uh, give us grace with one another uh, to, to understand these things as best we can and to hold to them uh, as closely as possible and where we need to uh, be cautious to be cautious and to give each other room. We thank you for your goodness, Father, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let me share some prayer requests, and you can share any prayer. And, and, I, and then we had to do a little business at the very end um, of that. So uh, here, here are some.